The pandemic offers humanity life-saving lessons, but are we listening? Here are some critical decisions that can benefit even save our future. COVID-19 disrupted our whole planet, but it could have been a lot worse. Did you know that the H5N1 avian flu is up to 24 times more deadly than the COVID-19 virus? Fortunately, that avian flu doesn't spread easily between people. Now listen to this insanity. A few years ago, genetic engineers created an airborne version of that lethal virus. Although it never escaped the laboratory, more than a hundred other genetically engineered microbes and viruses have escaped through accidents. So here's lesson number one. Don't tempt fate by genetically engineering potentially pandemic pathogens. Just don't do it. Perhaps the world finally has the resolve to make this happen. While we're at it, let's address other potentially catastrophic dangers of genetically engineered microbes that we can do something about now. What we're about to share is breathtaking. Experts reported in 1991 that the world was within two weeks of a genetically engineered microbe creating a global cataclysm. In truth, no one is absolutely sure what would have happened if the microbe was released as planned. Some try to dismiss this story as sensational, while others insist that we saved our precious ecosystem just in time. We share this not to create more fear, we have enough fear as it is, but rather to learn and implement another urgent lesson that can prevent devastating consequences. Be sure to stay through the end of this short presentation. You'll be relieved to hear the good news, that there's an emerging movement with a practical global plan that can protect us all, and you're invited to participate. But first, consider these examples. With the best of intentions, scientists genetically engineered bacteria to convert plant matter into alcohol. The plan was to distribute it to farmers so that they could mix it with leftover crop material to create alcohol, which would run their tractors. It sounded like a great thing because you could now, instead of field burning, you would rake up all of those residues on your field, put it in a bucket, big bucket, on your farm, inoculate this genetically engineered microorganism that produces alcohol, and in about mm, two weeks, open the spigot at the bottom of that bucket, and out comes 34 proof alcohol. Farmers would then take the nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom of the barrel and spread it on their fields. This bacterium had been tested through the standard toxicity testing and the fungicide, rodenticide, insecticide testing system of the EPA, and it passed with flying colors. It was fed to ducks, shrimp, and fish with no problem and was fully approved by the EPA. I had a graduate student that was interested in genetically engineered organisms. In an experiment that would ultimately be used to help him get his PhD, he mixed the sludge from the genetically engineered bacteria with soil and planted wheat seeds. My graduate student went into the laboratory of a Saturday morning and went, oh my gosh, a whole bunch of the plants are dead. All of those um, treatments where the genetically engineered bacterium had been present were dead. They were slime on the surface of the soil, just green mush. It actually was decomposed by the um, alcohol being produced by the Klebsiella planticula engineered to make alcohol. Thank goodness the graduate student decided to do this experiment. If he hadn't, the GMO bacteria was scheduled to be released two weeks later. So we were within two weeks of that genetically engineered organism being released out into the field in a, in a trial to show how far this genetically engineered organism could move. Two weeks. Bacteria doesn't just stay put. It would be carried by birds, it would be carried by insects, it would be carried by people, by cars, by machinery, by snakes and voles and shrews and mice. After this experiment, Dr. Ingham was told in private by an EPA employee just how far the bacteria would spread. The EPA conducted a secret experiment, which they deny they did to this day, where they allegedly released a genetically engineered bacteria in a field in Louisiana and then measured how far it would spread. It moved 11 miles in every direction in the first growing season. And the next year they could detect it even further out. According to Dr. Ingham's sources, the EPA stopped funding the experiment, but an employee on her own continued to monitor and test samples. And my understanding, talking to other people, 
from the EPA that that genetically engineered bacterium can be found every place on this planet. Every place. How could you get it back? What if the graduate student hadn't done the experiment and the alcohol-producing bacteria were released two weeks later? It would have affected the whole world. Once we release it, it can't be brought back, especially something like Klebsiella planticola, which is found in the root systems of all plants everywhere on the planet. Every time we test, it's there, it's present. All food plants, trees, grasses, brassicas, anything. And it's now going to start to produce alcohol. What's the effect of alcohol on the root systems of plants? It's to kill them. If the alcohol-producing bacteria were to outcompete and replace the natural version, we're talking about a real-world potential nightmare. You would lose corn, beans, peas, trees, grass, just everything that exists in a terrestrial system would be slowly but surely destroyed as this bacterium moved out. Looking at the ecological effect of a bacterium engineered this way, the logical consequence of releasing this to the real world would be that we would lose terrestrial plants. The alcohol-producing bacteria wasn't the first to be a near catastrophe. There was another bacterium called Pseudomonas syringae that was altered by scientists in the 1980s. They thought it would be a good idea to spread onto strawberries and potatoes to prevent frost damage. You see, Pseudomonas syringae normally takes water molecules, it aligns them, and it refrigerates them, which creates frost. Fortunately, when the company did do a field trial, they sterilized the soil soon after, so hopefully it hasn't been released. Ecologists fear that if it had been, it could colonize weeds like pigweed that would then survive the winter and proliferate. What's worse, however, is that we now know that Pseudomonas syringae in the atmosphere creates clouds. It creates rain and snow. If the ice minus had gotten out, it could theoretically change weather patterns. The big question is, if you release a GMO, will it survive? And will it outcompete the natural version of its species? For example, would the alcohol produced by the GMO bacteria kill off the natural version of the bacteria, allowing the GMO to replace it everywhere? We could argue whether this would happen, whether it really would have ended terrestrial plant life, or if ice minus would have changed weather patterns. But in reality, we don't know. And that's the point. We don't know. We don't have enough information to risk a release outdoors to find out. Companies such as Pivot Bio or Join with genetically engineering microbes to be released into, into the open environment, into fields. And uh, they're testing them already. Uh, they're doing it with companies such as Bio. And uh, that, that is going to be coming on stream very quickly across American fields. Releasing uh, biological organisms, and especially bacteria, into the environment seemed to me a deeply unwise thing to do. People were shocked to hear that a Chinese scientist genetically engineered human embryo. The controversial research was roundly condemned. Some people are very concerned about genetically engineering animals, less so with plants. As you go up to higher organisms, the ethical concerns grow. From an environmental standpoint, however, the smaller the organism, the more the danger. When you genetically engineer bacteria, algae, fungus, viruses, they can't be traced and they can proliferate easily around the planet. COVID-19 is a glaring example of how microorganisms and viruses, whether genetically engineered or not, can quickly encircle the globe. Creating infectious diseases is not the only way that genetically engineered microbes and viruses can damage our health. Another is by changing the composition of our body's microbiome, the bacteria and other microorganisms that live inside us. The microbiome has now been shown to be a major player in terms of our health, of immune health, longevity, production of vitamins. Then we have now found that the actual makeup of the microbiome, the gut bacteria, are responsible for different diseases. 
In the last five years alone, there's been over 50,000 published studies on the relationship between the microbiome and human health. The vast majority of diseases that we have to deal with, things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, dementia, psoriasis, eczema, even things like acne and reflux, these are all diseases that are related to a dysfunction within your microbial ecology. So changes in our inner ecosystem drive disease risk and drive these conditions. If we consume genetically modified bacteria from soil, there is an excellent possibility it will swap genetic information with the bacteria that reside in our gut. In 2004, a study verified that part of the genetic material that was inserted into genetically engineered soybeans transferred and was integrated into the DNA of human gut bacteria. The nature of things is for the microbes that we ingest to exchange genetic elements with the microbes that inhabit us. And when you're doing this with a genetically engineered microbe who's bringing in a gene that has never been tested or understood to function within the human system, the consequence of that could be completely unpredictable. The most common and consistent result from genetic engineering from the beginning has been surprise side effects. Altered organisms are basically altered complex systems. So any alteration that you make to them will result in unanticipated consequences. Microbes that live in us, on us, and all around us have the benefit of millions of years of evolution at their fingertips. We're just learning about it, and we're coming to understand the majesty and the beauty and the elegance of this natural ecosystem. But we're still at the tip of the iceberg on this whole topic. So what we don't want to do right now is start going down the road of starting to introduce unnatural genetic elements into this ecosystem. You can buy a do-it-yourself gene editing kit from Amazon for $169 so you can alter bacteria in the comfort of your own home. Now, the power of those kits is gonna grow. The cost of those kits is gonna go down. There are companies now with facilities full of robots driven by artificial intelligence for massive release. What if 100,000 different strains are released in this generation? What if it's a million? Each one with the potential to carry a different side effect, a different mutation. It could interact with the microbes in plants, in trees, in insects, in birds, and of course in humans and mammals itself. All of these elements have their own microecologies. And one of the things bacteria love to do is swap genetic elements. And so when they start swapping genetic elements with an engineered microbe, the outcome of that is impossible to predict. It could be absolutely catastrophic. Countries spend a fortune trying to remedy the introduction of invasive species. But once GMO bacteria are released, no policy can stop it. The time we have to control these things is before you release them. And that is the only time. In the United States and most countries, Genetically engineered microbes can be released without any meaningful government oversight. And in spite of the pandemics, scientists around the world continue to engineer pathogens which, if they escaped, could create devastating consequences. Strict laws and policies are urgently needed to protect us both from intentional release of engineered microbes and from accidents in facilities where these microbes and pathogens are used or stored. Tonight, this Center for Disease Control's bioterrorism lab and flu lab shut down after yet another frightening mistake. This time, a sample of the deadly H5N1 bird flu mistakenly shipped out to another lab, potentially putting other scientists at risk. This latest failure, discovered during an investigation into how 75 scientists were potentially exposed to anthrax in a CDC lab in Atlanta, the revelation coming just two days after we learned dried smallpox samples, which by international agreement are only stored at two high containment labs in the world, in Atlanta and Siberia, were discovered in a cardboard box in an unsecured government lab in Maryland. Today we learned those samples were alive and potentially deadly. This is the laboratory that we would expect to have the highest level of safety in the world. And if it can happen there, it can happen almost any other lab. It's high time we learn our lessons. But here's the good news. The pandemic woke people up. 
it sounded a global alarm about the dangers of microbes at the very same time that gene editing technology became so cheap and easy that virtually anyone can genetically engineer and release them. With all the negative consequences of the pandemic, there is at least this silver lining. Because of it, there's never been a better time in human history to rally the public and governments to safeguard our planet from catastrophes created by genetically engineered microorganisms. You've gotten a glimpse of the threats, now help create the solution. Please join us in this global endeavor. Now is the opportunity to protect our precious ecosystem, to protect humanity, to protect all future generations. With this new technology comes a new responsibility for every one of us. Please rise to the challenge and join this global movement. Whether you put in a few minutes or a few hours, your efforts to protect nature now will secure our future.